To get the latest voting rights and democracy news, subscribe to Democracy Docket's free newsletters. Click in the link in the upper right-hand corner to subscribe now. One of the things I'll give the right wing credit for is that they are always looking for a new angle to make voting harder and to undermine free and fair elections. Sometimes it's because they come up with some new law that is aimed at, you know, disenfranchising voters. Sometimes they're, you know, figuring out ways that the vice president can overturn free or fair elections. Uh, But recently, they have been really focused on procedural mechanisms to try to accomplish the same uh, outrageous goals. But now we have a new one that is gaining traction that I think we need to pay attention to. And it is an attack on what are referred to as private rights of action, Paige private rights of action. It's true. I think more and more we have been seeing some rulings, some concurrences, in some cases, some dissents, referencing this idea that people who are not the government don't have a right to sue over laws. And it's, Mark, like you said, this is called private right of action. It's kind of a legally technical term. It really gets into the nitty gritty of legal procedure, but it's a it's an important one and one that we think is going to come up as an issue more and more often. So let's get into it, starting with the absolute basics. Mark, what is a private right of action? Okay. So if you think about it in your daily lives, there are some laws that only the government can enforce, right? Think about the criminal laws. Like if you're walking down the street and someone punches you, you go to the police, you go to the DA, and they can charge that person and bring them to trial for assault. But like, you can't go to court and like try to put them in jail. Only the government can. So the criminal laws have no private right of action. There's no right for a individual to look at the criminal laws and say, I am going to play the role of prosecutor in bringing this person into federal court for charges. There are other laws that totally have a private right of action, right? If you're walking down the street, you get punched, you can sue them for money damages for uh, for punching you, right? For, For injuring you. And that is a private right of action. There, the case would be Moskowitz versus Puncher, right? In the first case, it would be United States versus Puncher. In the second case, it would be Moskowitz versus Puncher. And that's because you do have a private right of action to sue for, you know, when you are subject to that kind of, um, that kind of attack. Then there's a, a third kind of cases where both get to sue, right? Where you both get to enforce the law, both the, the, uh, the government can bring the case or a private party can bring a case. So like, for example, the federal government has passed a whole bunch of laws in the government contracting arena involving government contract fraud, where it says, okay, the government can go after fraud in the government contracting arena, but so can private parties who become aware of it, right? They can be sort of like mini attorneys general, you know, enforcing these laws. And Congress oftentimes relies on those those um, that those hybrid statutes uh, because they can't be everywhere. They can't bring every kind of claim. And so they want to make sure that there is the ability of others who may detect things that DOJ doesn't see or may have the resources or the um, the, the ability to bring a case that DOJ doesn't. And that is vitally important in so many aspects of our law, but none more so than in the area of voting rights. So private right of action is the idea that a non-governmental actor can bring a lawsuit to enforce some laws. We see this all the time in voting rights, Mark, like you said, when, you know, the ACLU files a lawsuit, the NAACP LDF files a lawsuit. They are suing over the Voting Rights Act. They're trying to enforce this law. I don't think people fully understand how important it is that groups like that can bring lawsuits to make sure voting rights are being protected. 
Yeah, the majority of lawsuits in this country that protect the right to vote, that protect against racial discrimination in voting, that protect against age discrimination in voting, most of those cases are brought by private litigants. So every time you see a case that is, you know, Smith versus Texas or Merrill versus Milligan, which is the Alabama case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, what you're talking about is a case that was brought by a private party to enforce the federal law. And if you take the private parties out of that equation and say they can't bring that case, that only the Department of Justice can bring that case, then you're going to see vastly vastly fewer cases brought, and it will particularly harm voters at the local level, where oftentimes these cases are brought by local community organizations that are aware of a particularized set of violations that you know, DOJ wouldn't know about or wouldn't have the resources to remedy. So I think some people would ask, what would be the harm in putting all the responsibility on the government? Like putting the responsibility on the Department of Justice to be aware of these issues and to bring all of these lawsuits. Isn't it good if it's the DOJ bringing a lawsuit? Does that put more weight behind a claim or an allegation that voting rights are being violated? So first of all, you would have to radically, radically increase the size of the voting rights section of the Department of Justice. Merrick Garland, to his credit, has doubled the size of that voting section. But I think when he doubled it, it went from like 12 lawyers to 20 or 24 lawyers. Um, right now, Democracy Docket uh, is tracking uh, 200 active lawsuits. Um, and DOJ has, has brought five of them. Now, that's five really important cases. So I don't want to diminish that. But but this shows how the regime was set up, right? It was set up to allow private litigants to fill in the gap. So you'd have to dramatically increase the size of the Department of Justice. But the second thing, Paige, is you would lose a lot of the dynamism that comes out of having people in the community bringing lawsuits. You know, when we talk about Merrill versus Milligan, Milligan, who is the the was the plaintiff, uh, Merrill is the Republican Secretary of State of Alabama, but Milligan is an activist, a voting rights activist in Alabama. Like he is part of the fiber of the community that is being disadvantaged by the state of Alabama and depriving agency to those communities, I think, would do real damage uh, beyond who is bringing the case. But then the, the last thing, Paige, is, of course, is that if you if only the Department of Justice could bring cases, what would you do when Bill Barr was the attorney general? What would happen then? And so I think the I think that the right wing is is banking on a couple of things if they win. Number one, the Department of Justice will never expand. I mean, Congress will never appropriate funds to expand the voting section as broadly as they'd have to. But number two, in in time periods when Republicans controlled the executive branch, there would be virtually no uh, enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. So, the, so, Mark, the vast majority of lawsuits to protect voting rights in the United States are actually being brought by private litigants, by voters who can explain to you why these laws are so detrimental to them, how themselves and their communities are being harmed. The DOJ just doesn't have the capacity to bring all the litigation necessary. So that is a weak point that Republicans are now exploiting, right? This idea that the DOJ doesn't have the capacity to bring it, like you point out in a, an administration that is anti-voting, that is supporting voter suppression, if the DOJ is the only entity that can defend voting rights, there will be no defense of voting rights. What is happening now in court involving private rights of action that is concerning to you? So we see increasingly 
Republican officials and conservative organizations laying the groundwork to try to deprive private organizations and private individuals the ability to enforce the voting laws. This should be seen through the lens of the other rollbacks that uh, the same people have been engaged in, starting with the gutting of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which, remember, Page meant that states covered with histories of racial discrimination had to bring their voting changes to the Department of Justice precisely so they would be aware of them and could block them from going into effect. Then, of course, we saw the independent state legislature theory um, as as the next thing that the right wing wanted to promote. And now with private rights of action, we see a couple of cases, uh, one in Arkansas, which involves the Voting Rights Act, and one in Texas that invi involves what's referred to as the Civil Rights Act, which was a predecessor law to the Voting Rights Act, but both of them are vital tools in the protection of, uh, of voting. In both of those cases, we have seen Republican uh, politicians try to strip a private right of action. Mike, let's go through each of these cases. So in Texas, this is a case called Vote.org versus Kalanen, and it's dealing with kind of a funky voter registration law in the Lone Star State. Isn't every voting law in the Lone Star State kind of funky, Paige? And that would be why three of the five cases the DOJ is currently litigating is, is in the state of Texas. Right. And there's probably no state that private right of action is more important because, as you say, DOJ is already dedicating a lot of its resources in Texas. And you don't want to allow Ken Paxton to simply be able to overwhelm the ability of the DOJ to bring these cases by, you know, telling the legislature to pass more terrible voting laws. Uh, but the Vote.org case, and for full disclosure, my law firm represents Vote.org, uh, involved an online voter registration, essentially prohibition that uh, that Texas has concocted. The law in Texas says that if you submit a voter registration form electronically, so via email, via fax, something like that, you then have to follow up with a physical hard copy of that voter registration form that has your pen to paper signature on it. It's what's known as a wet ink or a wet signature. You're not fully registered to vote in Texas until the state has that pen to paper signature form. Right. And if you're scratching your head and asking, why on earth would you have to do that? Right. Like, why, why would you possibly, if you're trying to register to vote, why does the state of Texas need your pen to paper wet ink signature when most commerce and business in this country, including in Texas, is done via other than wet ink signatures. Um, we've got a law for you, and it's called the Materiality Provision of the Civil Rights Act, which essentially prohibits states from having laws or processes or procedures that add immaterial requirements in order to be able to register to vote. OK, so so the state of Texas can't add a provision that is that doesn't relate to qualifications for being a voter. And that's what Texas did here. It added this immaterial provision to its law in order to make voting harder, simply to make fewer people be able to register uh, and the like. And so Vote.org, which many of you know, is a wonderful organization. They provide uh, people the ability to register to vote online, uh, brought a lawsuit. The trial court agreed that this provision violated the materiality uh, uh, clause of the Civil Rights Act. And Ken Paxton, the, he's still indicted, right, Paige? You know, he's been indicted for 10 years. I think it'll be more of a surprise when he's not indicted than when he right. is. So Ken Paxton, the uh, attorney general of Texas, ha is now arguing before the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that uh, Vote Latino and Vote.org, the two plaintiffs in that case, uh, 
don't have standing to bring this case because there is no private right of action. In other words, only the Department of Justice, in their view, could enforce this materiality provision. Mark, I think it's important to mention here that the Department of Justice did not bring this case, did not bring Vote.org v. Kalanen, but they are now involved in it specifically because of this allegation of private right of action not existing under the Civil Rights Act, right? Yeah. In fact, the Department of Justice is, is taking the position, of course, there's a private right of action. Right. So that should be very influential on a court because usually the government is quite protective where it believes it is the only entity that can enforce the law. It is quite protective of that right. And that comes up oftentimes uh, in cases that go to the U.S. Supreme Court about whether the government is able to protect it itself as the only litigant for something. And here the Department of Justice is saying the opposite. They're saying, no, no, in fact, there is a private right of action here and that the courts ought to continue to recognize this. In Texas, there's an attack on the private right of action under the materiality provision of the Civil Rights Act. In Texas's bordering state, Arkansas, there's also a lawsuit alleging that there's not a private right of action, but this time under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act in a redistricting case. Yeah, and this would have unbelievably sweeping implications because since the enactment of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, it has been assumed by everyone, by every court, that there is a private right of action. In fact, almost every major Section 2 redistricting case has been brought by private plaintiffs. Uh, you almost can't think of a major Section 2 case that wasn't brought by individual voters affected by the districts that were drawn. I mentioned Merrill versus Milligan uh, uh, as a recent example, but it is only the most recent example in a long line of examples. In fact, the case Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee was a Section 2 case brought by the DNC and voters, uh, and that case was adjudicated fairly recently before the Supreme Court. Justice Alito ruled uh, in a Section 2 case and never once said there is no private right of action, right? So this, the conservatives, the liberals, everyone involved in the federal court system has recognized or assumed a private right of action to bring redistricting cases. Uh, and all of a sudden, um, out of the blue, a Trump-appointed judge in Arkansas decided that there was no private right of action and shut down a redistricting case brought by the Arkansas State Conference of the NAACP. And this is a very, very, very dangerous situation if it were to be adopted more broadly, because, you know, the, the, the this gutting of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was a traumatic experience. But in that opinion, Just, Chief Justice Roberts promised everyone that, that that decision was not going to affect the scope and the ability to enforce the nationwide ban on racial discrimination in voting protected by Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And if now there is no one who can enforce that other than the Department of Justice, then the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court's promise will have been an empty one. In Arkansas, this case has gone up to the Eighth Circuit. And again, the Department of Justice has gotten involved to say that there is a private right of action under Section 2. During or oral argument, the attorney representing the United States said that this question of whether Section 2 is enforceable shouldn't have come up before this court. But if the court is asking that question, quote, the answer is clearly yes, that there is a private right of action. Now, Mark, SCOTUS has ruled before that there is a private right of action under both Section 5. They ruled that in 1969 in Allen versus State Board of Elections and in 1996 in Morse versus Republican Party of Virginia. SCOTUS said that although Section 2, like Section 5, provides no right to sue on its face, the existence of a private right of action under Section 2 has been clearly intended by Congress since 1965. Now, notably, the justice to dissent on that in 1996 was Justice Clarence Thomas, uh, who remains on the bench today. 
And the modern source of where the Trump appointed judge in Arkansas got this idea of no private right of action came from a concurrence by Justice Gorsuch, joined by Justice Thomas in Brnovich versus DNC in 2021. Yeah, I mentioned that case because, as I said, Justice Alito authored the majority opinion there. Justice Alito is not exactly a member of the liberal contingent on the U.S. Supreme Court. But as you note, um, Justice Thomas, for decades now, has taken the position there's no private right of action uh, uh, under the Voting Rights Act. But he's been alone in that. You know, it's it's his standing position, but but that's but you know that's that's been that. What was notable in Brnovich is that uh, Justice Gorsuch kind of went out of his way to say, by the way, you know. In fact, I think he used the I phrase. I believe he used the term just flagging. Just flagging. Yeah. Which is, you know, kind of a weird thing in a court of opinion, you know, for him to say just flagging um, that uh, he doesn't think that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act has a private right of action. And it was clear he was flagging this precisely for the the lower courts to make a controversial ruling so that this could come up through the federal courts and presumably at some point make its way back to the U.S. Supreme Court. But Paige, I want to add one thing to that, which is that there is a longstanding doctrine in the federal court system that lower courts are not to anticipate the overruling of existing precedent. Okay. The idea is that until the Supreme Court itself overrules its own precedent, a lower court is bound by the U.S. Supreme Court. And that has been a principle that has been respected for, you know, 100 plus years. Until recently, when in a series of cases, including, frankly, some of the abortion cases, lower courts with very, very conservative judges started to issue rulings that were clearly at odds with controlling Supreme Court precedent, right? I mean, Roe v. Wade was controlling Supreme Court precedent. Casey was controlling Supreme Court precedent. And yet you started to see lower judges, lower court judges, anticipate that that those could be overruled and rule contrary. And that is that's that's a trend we've seen. And I think this situation in Arkansas is a little bit like that, right? Where And it's what Texas is hoping the Fifth Circuit will do, which is kind of have them lean into what they hope will be the trend, which is improper in itself and further undermines confidence in the judiciary. Uh, but I also think in this instance doesn't command a majority of the Supreme Court. I don't think there is a majority of the Supreme Court right now to overturn the longstanding right of private right of action. Uh, but, but Paige, I think that's a worrying trend that we should be watching across a range of issues. So Mark, so Mark, just to sum it all up, a private right of action is when a private party, someone who is not the government, can file a lawsuit to enforce a law. Since the passage of the VRA in 1965, there has been this idea that, yes, private parties, of course, can sue to protect voting rights across the country. The, va the vast majority of these cases challenging voter suppression laws, challenging unfair maps, come from private parties, come from voters who are fighting for themselves and their communities. The DOJ may step in when necessary, but it isn't filing as many cases as private parties. And you now have these questions before the Fifth Circuit and the Eighth Circuit uh, where Republicans are saying, no, there is no private right of action. All those decades of precedent that you should be looking at, completely ignore it. We have this new idea. We're right. There is no private right of action. And there are at least one or two justices on the U.S. Supreme Court that seem amenable to the idea. I think the question people want to know, though, is are there any cases currently before the U.S. Supreme Court dealing with private right of action at all or dealing with private rights of action in relation to voting rights? Yeah, so the obvious case that is before the Supreme Court is Mer Merrill versus Milligan. Now, Merrill versus Milligan is a Section 2 case. It is a Section 2 case brought by private parties. 
No one um, in the case has suggested lack of private right of action. It was not something that any of the justices focused on during the oral argument. So I think it would be a very unlikely outcome that the Supreme Court there would say there's no private right of action. I would expect that Justice Thomas would continue to take the position that there isn't. Perhaps uh, Justice Gorsuch now joins uh, that, you know, that that lineup. Uh, but I don't think that 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 it will happen in that case. I think that if there is going to be a frontal assault on private right of action in the same way that there has been on in so many other areas, it'll come up on a straight line case where that is central. So, you know, the Arkansas case on Section 2, the Fifth Circuit case that you mentioned out of Texas uh, on the materiality provision, I think would it would be a case postured like that. Mark? Let's imagine absolute worst case scenario, doomsday. The U.S. Supreme Court says Republicans are right. There is no private right of action under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, under the materiality provision of the Civil Rights Act, of under all of these federal laws that are meant to protect the right to vote. There is no private right of action. What does that mean? Uh, it would be probably the most dramatic change to the protection of voting rights that we have seen in 50 years. Uh, it would have such a cataclysmic effect on the voting rights of millions and millions of Americans that it's hard even to fathom because there aren't a huge number of tools to fight against voter suppression. There aren't a huge number of tools to fight against unfair districting. One of them is state constitutions. Well, we're waiting on the Moore v. Harper case to see whether or not state constitutions remain a powerful tool to prevent voter suppression. The other are federal laws. And these are the federal laws that we're talking about. If you take out of the, the arsenal being able to sue in state court using state constitutions and unable to sue in federal court using the federal voting and civil rights laws, then frankly, what's left to protect voters against their legislatures if the legislatures decide to disenfranchise them? What is left if the state of Alabama or the state of Mississippi decides that it is going to pass a law that targets black voters with near surgical precision as North Carolina did in, in 2013? There won't be a lot left. I mean, all that will be left is hoping that the Department of Justice steps in. But Congress right now is not going to authorize more money for the voting rights section of DOJ. Kevin McCarthy is not going to do that. He wants to cut that. And God forbid you have a ruling like this. And then you have a Republican president who appoints and an attorney general who simply says, I'm not going to enforce this, then there's nothing protecting those voters. They'll be left without anything, and we will have repealed the promise and the hope that we made and gave people after 1965. And that will be a tragedy for those communities. It will be a tragedy for those states, and it will be a tragedy for America. And let's just hope that doesn't happen. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. If you enjoyed today's episode, leave us a review. To find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and elections news, visit democracydocket.com and subscribe to our free daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Paige Moskowitz, Alexa Rothenberg, and Sophie Feldman. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz with help from Sophie Feldman. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.